Hello all, welcome to my channel. Today I am going to talk on meat, which is the most consumed ingredient in most of the countries, Asia, Europe and America. The highest consumption of meat is more than the vegetable consumption in India. I am HOD Food Production and Associate Professor at AISSMS College of Hotel Management and Catering Technology. Let's understand meat cookery. Before we begin, let's discuss what are the objectives which we are going to cover in this topic. We need to understand what is meat, its classification, aging of meat, rigor mortis, slaughtering processes, meat structure and consumption, and then we will learn different meats, its cuts, fabricated cuts, primal cuts, its usage in cooking methods and different cooking methods applied to different types of meat. Let's begin. What is meat? Meat is an animal flesh that is used as a food for the consumption. Meat has various traditions and rituals associated with it in different cultures such as kosher and halal. Muslims never prefer jatka meat, they always prefer a halal meat. As well as there are many prohibitions in Hindus, Buddhists and Jews. These are many prohibitions which allow meat consumption to grow or Nutritional importance Importance of meat is an excellent source of protein which is an essential for any healthy diet. It helps to build and repair muscles as well as it helps to maintain the healthy hair, bone, skin and blood. Due to its high biological value, protein obtained from meat is easily digested and thus absorbed quickly and effectively by the body. What you all see in the picture is nothing but a slaughterhouse. Back in the World War II, when this slaughtering and preserving of meat started in France, the slaughterhouse and butcher house were called abattoirs. Classification of meat is basically classified into two categories, white meat and red meat. What is a white meat? White meat which is obtained from poultry and seafood and red meat which is obtained from mammals or cattle and animals. Pork is from a meat which is obtained from hog and pig. Wheat is a meat which is obtained from calves of young cattle. Beef from adult cow. Belly from from deer. Care beef from carbow. Chino from goat. Lamb from young sheep and mutton from Myoglobin is an important pigment in blood which gives red color. The redness of meat depends on the species, animal, age and the fiber type. Red meat contains more narrow muscle fiber while white meat contains more broader muscle fibers. White meat has lesser myoglobin and red meat has more myoglobin concentration. Hence, the meat are categorized as red meat and poultry and fish meat is categorized as white meat. Lamb, mutton and hogget. They are nothing but the varieties obtained from sheep. The meat of a sheep in its first year is known as lamb. That of a juvenile sheep older than one year is a hogget and the meat of an adult sheep is called as or a goat is called as mutton. The meat of a lamb is taken from the animal between 1 month to 1 year old with the carcass weighing between 5.5 to 30 kg. Beef It is one of the principal meat used in cuisines of Middle East, Australia, Europe and United States. It is also important in Africa, parts of Asia and South Asia. Beef is considered prohibited food in most of the cultures like Hindus, Jains and Buddhists. Beef is highly concentrated with protein. 
The other parts of beef are also included in the cuisines like oxtail, tongue, fried, sweet bread, and many more. Pork. The word pork denotes specifically the fresh meat obtained from the pig that is left unsalted. It is one of the most commonly consumed meat worldwide under the branch of shakuhachi. Pork can also be processed into different forms. Many also extended the shelf life, which is like sausages, ham, and bacon. Rigor mortis. It is a one of the major stage which needs to be occurred for the good tender meat. The line action continues in market eating even after meat is slaughtered. And that's why the meat is no longer green. Holding meat in controlled conditions for naturally tenderizing is called as aging. Green meat is a meat which doesn't get enough time to stop food and it does not develop much flavor. At the time of the slaughtering, the meat needs to be hung for rigor mortis to pass. It gradually disappears. 3 to 4 days are required for beef. Less time required for lamb, veal and pork. All fresh beef is aged for at least few days and up to several weeks for enzymes naturally present in the meat. Break down the muscle tissues resulting into improved texture and these rigor mortis enzymes help to break down these muscle tissues. Most beef is aged either by wet aging or dry aging. Rigor mortis is a very very important technology which naturally occurs in any of the meat for the tenderness immediately after slaughtering. Composition of any meat Meat consists of water 75%, protein in the form of myosin and myoxin which is jointly present, ectomycin that is around 75%, 19%, then it contains fat approximately 2.5% which is important for the three reasons for the juiciness, tenderness and the flavor. What you see in the picture is nothing but a dissect of a meat muscle. That is to explain you the structure of meat which is directly linked with the tenderness of the meat during cooking. Lean tissue consists of one or more muscles which is made up of many bundles of muscle fibers. Connective tissue. Surround the fibers and unite them into bundles. Collagen arranged in parallel do not Stretch, color is white and it is disintegrated in water. Lastin is yellowish in portion. It is do not tenderize the meat while cooking and it does not disintegrate in the water. These tissues are very very important to understand because if you understand which tissues to maintain and which tissues to break down during pounding helps in cooking meat more tender. Aging. As I have spoken in the rigor mortis sector, aging is a process of preparing meat for consumption. By aging it, it's a process during which microbes and enzymes act upon the meat to help to break down the connective tissue to tenderize the meat. These are two ways, wet aging and dry aging. Wet aging usually happens in vacuum packed plastic with the brine solution. And dry aging usually happens by dehydrating the meat in the control temperature. Green meat simply means the meat which does not have sufficient time to go under this process of rigor mortis and aging. What you see in the picture, the lower picture is the aged meat and the upper picture is the green meat. Dry aging. It is a process of storing meat usually large cuts under careful control conditions. The meat is not packaged or wrapped and it is exposed to air from all sides. 
If you all heard that Parma hair, which is an absolutely popular and very very well known ham from Italy, is dry aged. Temperature and humidity and air circulation are precisely controlled to prevent the spoilage. During dry aging, the meat loses its weight up to 20% because of dehydration. Now we will see the process of weight aging. The enzyme still has time to tenderize the meat enough to make it acceptable. And the biggest plus in this process is there is no weight loss. The weight remains intact because it's a process where it is surrounded with fluid or brine solution. Weight aging also develops good flavor but dry aging develops intense flavor. Weight aging is more cost effective, does not require much expensive equipment for the control temperature. And today, most wholesalers prefer weight aging because it can be done even for the smaller fabricated cuts. Before we move on, let's see the video which talks about aging. Dry aging is the process of removing moisture from the product and allowing the lipids within the muscle to break down slowly over time. It's kind of a controlled deterioration of the muscle to get something that's much more tender and that actually goes through a flavor transformation, which we think is really important. Dry aging is expensive, it's luxurious, but it just tastes incredible. And that's, that's, that's why we go through the trouble, that's why we spend the extra money. At Oak Steakhouse, our flavor profile that we've sort of gravitated to, it's pretty full body dry aged flavor. It's adults only, it's not for kids. First timers that had tried dry aged, sometimes it's a little too much for them. Like I said, it's not for everyone, it really isn't. It's an uh, it's, uh, experienced steak eater's cut. It's almost become generic to describe it as sort of the notes of blue cheese, but that is precisely what it is. And in fact, if you look at a majestically aging loin or a rib of beef, you will see those veins that you get in blue cheese working their way through. And that is the same mold and it does indeed have the same flavor profile. During the dry aging process, you're taking the natural enzymes in the meat that would be active whether they're dry aging or wet aging. Wet aging is just in a bag. But dry aging, you're taking the meat and you're putting it out into an open air environment. So the natural enzymes are breaking down the muscle tissue, making it more tender. However, the cool part about dry aging is that you're allowing other environmental impact to be had upon that piece of meat. The notes that you get from dry aging, the flavor notes, the aromatics, are likely going to be imparted by the different molds and yeasts that are going to land on the meat and start populating it. One type of mold that we know that we're finding on there is Penicillium nalgiovense. It's a mold that's a very white, powdery mold that you're going to find oftentimes on salami. We're likely going to be finding some other molds common in the culinary world, the Penicillium roqueforti, which is going to be found in blue cheeses. You're going to likely find yeasts, which are part of the fungal kingdom, in particular possibly uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is used for brewing and baking. Now the controls that we can incorporate into dry aging um, are often going to be temperature, number one, it's very easy to control temperature for the most part, but then we try to control humidity somewhat to slow the migration of the moisture or get the right amount of migration of moisture during the, the dry aging process. Temperature in here ranges somewhere between 37, 38 degrees on average. It's definitely not freezing. Freezing would stop all the bacterial activity and would stop the aging process, so we don't want to ever do that. Temperature is important because we want to age product for 30, 40, 45 days. And in order to do that, you definitely have to have temperature low enough. Otherwise, you'll end up with spoilage and something that spoils as opposed to aging correctly. I don't recommend just anybody taking a piece of meat and put it in a refrigerator because you're not going to have the air movement that's necessary to get that uniform 
uh, migration of the moisture out of the meat. The folks that do dry aging on a large scale, they're, they're truly artists. Uh, from the meat science perspective, I get a lot of questions, you know, tell me the science of dry aging. I can tell you what has happened, but I can't necessarily tell you what's going to happen. That's kind of the cool part about dry aged meats. It's going to be different no matter where you go or what you do. It's different in every environment and you are left to the environment and, and what it's going to impart into the flavors. Right now we have about 4,200 pieces of beef in here, well north of 90,000 pounds and uh, close to $900,000 in, in value. So it's a, this is more than just an, an avocation. This is a labor of love, but it's a, it's a financial risk reward game as well. Uh, I think it's very hard to replicate a room this size with this much beef. You try to dry age 10 or 12 pieces of meat in a small box, it's never gonna have the same patina that a room like this with 4,000 plus pieces of meat will have. We have a really perfect environment here for this. It's built for this, it's what we do, and I don't know that many restaurants can really replicate exactly what we do here. Different rooms respond very differently to beef. You go to the De Braga room, for example, and it's absolutely cavernous, it's massive. And when you have that much volume, paradoxically, it's easy to control than if you have a microclimate, right? Where the slightest variation will completely throw off the room. That room is so big that they have much more, they have a little bit more leeway, let's say. It's also among the cleanest rooms. Like you go to the old school, like an old school steakhouse where there's like wood everywhere and cardboard lining and like the steak, you know, the guy looks as dry aged as the steaks he's pulling off. So, you know, when you walk into the doors of steakhouses, it's like the first thing that hits you is that from the age box. But the Brahm is not like that. I mean, there, you get those subtle notes, but it's, it's a very, it's almost like you're walking into a science lab, you know, and I think that that's how the modern butcher needs to approach dry aging. If you're getting into dry aging now, don't build a wooden box, you know, we're in the 21st century. It's like in a, being in a cheese locker where you have tons of cheese and you walk in and you put a fresh piece of cheese in there and all the bacteria in that room start to work on the new cheese that you bring in. Same here, if we, in a week we'll put up seven, eight hundred, a thousand pieces of meat, of new meat in here. So we're introducing a ton of humidity, which is why we have the high speed fans. That, that adds to our humidity level naturally just by the amount of meat we put in every single week. Anytime you start off with a premium product, you're going to have a premium result. With the marbling and the fat content of a prime, you're going to get more flavor as it dry ages. So the marbling allows the penetration. The fat itself is softer tissue, it's, it's more permeable. That, and it almost becomes a conduit for those flavors. Marbling for me is the most important criteria. If you have a really great piece of marbled beef and you age it correctly, you should have a great, great finished end product for sure. You can get kind of floral notes. You can get almost even an alcoholic note when you first cut into it. It's a beautiful smell that comes off of these. Oh my God, Georgia's. Those aromatics are still in the meat. And so when you cook meat, you're waking up the molecules that are there. You're exciting the molecules with the heat. And that's what comes up to our noses. That's what comes up to our olfactory senses. And that's where dry aging really takes this big leap beyond just conventional aging of meat. You really get that intense flavor. Not all folks like that intense flavor, but we're finding a lot of people do. So I often draw the comparison of the difference between dry aged beef and wet aged beef as the difference between grape juice and wine. And wine is from the same liquid, yet because it's fermented, it's developed complex flavors far beyond regular grape juice. Regular grape juice is delicious, it's very sweet. It's refreshing, but it doesn't have a lot of complexity. Wet aged beef is delicious. I mean, look, who's gonna turn down a juicy hamburger? But when you're making a steak, which is the most prized and important part of that animal, to elevate it with dry aging, I think, is the right way to really honor that animal's life, honor the process, and honor the guest, indeed. I love wet age, I do. There's times when I'm, I've gotta have the dry age, I'm chasing that flavor. They're both great, but it's just, they're both different platforms. It's, we're in the golden age of dry aging. People are pushing it. 28 days is what you really need, right, to get that steak to, a, to the proper tensile strength. There is in some imposition of flavor on that, but the further you go, the more desiccate the meat becomes, 
and the more profound and distinct the flavor is. So I've had steaks up to 420 days that are no longer beef. We like the 50 day, 55 day age. It's a flavor that our clientele likes in Charleston. You get some of these ones that go a long time, 90 days, 85 days. Even personally, that's not the flavor profile that I'm looking for. You know, I think it's important to remember that at one time, all meat was dry aged. They were hanging whole carcasses. That has the same effect as dry aging and now it's become a bit perverse, quite frankly, when you're just taking short loins and rib sections and dry aging them. Dry aging is new to a new generation of people who are enjoying meat. Dry aging used to be what we always did. Prior to refrigeration, meat was always just kind of hung in open air environments, and there are still countries that do that. What's old is new, and what's new is cool, and that's what we're having this resurgence in the meat community. Those who enjoy meat are really starting to better understand the benefits of dry aged meat. People are looking for this next level of eating experience and that's what dry aging can really bring to folks. This, this video will tell you exactly the process of dry aging and why it is important. about the storage. When storing fresh meat, poultry and products, all cultures meat should be unwrapped and hung so that air can circle it around them. They should be stored at 1 degree to 3 degree Celsius and in walking refrigerator by freezing the food in the increase the shelf life of the product and the fresh meat needs to be refrigerated immediately. These are the temperature and the given in the world. Thank you all for watching this video. In the part 2, we will learn the different parts of meat for pork, beef, lamb. We will also learn different cooking methods. And in the part 3, we will learn the slaughtering process of meat and its importance. Do not forget to attempt the quiz given in the description by clicking on the link. Thank you so much. At the restaurant here, we kind of look at um, color, you know, and feel of the steak rather than, you know, poking it with a thermometer or poking it with a fork or, because really you never want to do that. Once you poke it, you lose juice, you lose blood, and you start to lose the, the quality of the good steak. First thing uh, when cooking steaks to, to, to a certain temperature, you have to realize every grill is different. My medium rare steak, is gonna cook a lot faster than if you're trying to cook it on a barbecue grill. A trick that I learned in school, I'm using your hand to just check the, the softness and, of the steak. When you touch your finger here, and you can see it's very soft right here, and you just kind of run down. This would be rare, this would be medium rare, this would be medium, and this would be well done. Medium rare for us is about seven, seven minutes and 30 seconds. A nice caramelized deep brown color. We don't play with the steak, we don't turn it and turn it again and keep turning it. We turn it once. We season it, we put it on the grill. When we see that nice caramelized oniony looking color, 
We flip it once, and you can kind of see how soft it is when we do it with the hand. And you press in how soft it is. And as you see here, these are going to be our well done in our medium well. Cooking meat is not complicated and by keeping a few simple rules in mind you're almost guaranteed success. And this first rule I can't repeat often enough. It's the too soon, too soon rule. A. Don't cook meat too soon after taking it out of the fridge. It'll never get where you want it inside and outside if it's ice cold in the middle. Oh sure it might look okay on the outside but it won't be done inside. And B, don't cut into the meat too soon after cooking. Give the juices a chance to work their way back into the meat or it will be dry. Okay, next, season well. When it comes to seasoning, since the steak is so dense and you can't really season on the inside, you need to be bold on the outside. And that means liberally using kosher salt and fresh ground pepper. And by the way, kosher salt and fresh ground pepper are very often all a good piece of meat needs. And finally, cut across the grain. You hear it all the time, cut across the grain, but no one tells you why, so I will. Think of the grain in meat as long muscle fibers that run parallel to one another. You can see the grain here. Here's the deal, if you cut with the grain, you end up having to try and chew through those long fibers and that can be difficult. But if you slice against the grain, you end up with very short pieces of fiber and those are easy to deal with. Simple rules, yes, but trust me, they will make all the difference. All the difference.